Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm really excited today to have our guest, Jason Bartley, with us today. Jason retired after 15 years as an IT program manager for a large global company. He's got 18 years of rental real estate experience. He uh, currently owns over 100 doors as an independent rental owner and is a partner in over 1,600 doors throughout Texas. He owns a property management company uh, and some other exciting stuff. And I'll, you know, without any further ado, Jason, welcome to the show. How are you, man? Hey, Devin Elder. How's it going, brother? Good to, good to see you online here. Yeah, man. I know we, we had tried to kind of set this up for a, for an in-office in meeting, but you're in Austin. I'm in San Antonio and the traffic between the two uh, is not getting any better, is it? It's getting bad. It's getting bad. What used to be a 30 minute drive is now an hour and 30 minute drive. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which like as investors, that's a good thing. There's so many darn people moving to Texas that uh, we like those the, the positive net migration, we like the trends, but sometimes traffic, especially what you guys are seeing in Austin, it's like, uh, it's, it's pretty wild sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. First world problems, right? We'll take absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> That's it, man. Uh, well, let's kick off with like a little, a little bit of your background. And I kind of want to work through to kind of your progression over the years to being, you know, a multifamily owner of a lot of units and, and maybe some lessons learned along the way. But what, um, What's your, your background story and how did you make your way to, to real estate as an investor? Yeah, yeah. So I, I started off the way most people do. Uh, I was, you know, a typical normal middle class kid, um, you know, went to high school and I, I said, what after that? And, you know, your, your parents guide you in the, the direction they know best. So they said, hey, you know, go to college. And that, that's what I did. I was the first kid in my whole family and extended family to, to go to college. So Went to college, got a management information systems degree, and then uh, got out into corporate America, and I uh, went right into uh, to project management, uh, IT related, and then into global IT program management, and did that for about 15 years. But um, is I mean, as soon as I got into to corporate America, I, I knew right away. Looking at my boss, you know, my my boss's boss of hey, here's here's the path for me, and I was chained to the desk, chained to the office. And I, I knew that wasn't my path, but I, I didn't know what my way out was. So I kind of, you know, that was back in uh, 07. You remember all those house flipping shows, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what got me off my rocker. You know, I got real hyped up on all those shows and I said, hey, here's the ticket. I found it. <laughs> so what I did is I, I got a buddy that was a realtor and uh, we found a home. I'm actually from Southern California and this was in uh, Rancho Cucamonga. Found a good deal on it, and uh, we uh, we bought it. And I said, "Hey, I'm going to do everything myself and save money. This is going to be great. Classic. I'm not going to go out, spend any money." So, yes. I had my friends and family over there. We did all the rehab. Should have been, and you're an expert in this arena, but it should have been two weeks. It took us three months, and I barely got out with a little bit of equity as a as the market was coming down over there. So Just I didn't want to do that. Again. Oh seven, oh seven, yeah. Yeah. So I, after that, I, it was just too much work. We, we, we did make a little bit of money, but I, I definitely didn't want to do any flips. I, I know people make money if they do it right, but I just didn't know how to do it correctly. So I, uh, I said, hey, you know, maybe, maybe buy and hold's the route and looked in, in California. Couldn't find anything near me that made sense. And I actually had a buddy. He sold uh, title insurance. So he had access to, to the U.S. wide databases to, to look at market um, data. And I think we settled on, uh, there's four markets. There's uh, the Carolinas, there was Colorado, uh, Florida, and Texas. And it, it just happened to, to work out. I was searching um, Austin, Texas, I fell on and, and found a fourplex for sale and analyzed the heck out of it. I mean, I, I must have spent three weeks on it, petrified to put in an offer. This is my first rental. Scared the bejeebus out of me. But uh, finally, I just said, hey, you know, I had a bad day at work. And I said, if not now, when? And put in an offer and got an accepted offer on that, that fourplex. So that was my first real entry into, into buy and hold. Yeah, outstanding. That first one can be terrifying. Was it, uh, it was occupied and, and was it in good shape or was it a big like uh, rehab component to it? 
Yeah, no, it was in pretty good shape. Uh, no major rehab, Class C, uh, working Class C area in, in Austin, Texas. And I, I still have it to this day. It's, it's a little cash cow. So no, no major yeah. rehab, uh, 1985 asset. So pitch roofs, it's, it's a good property. Yeah, no doubt. And Austin, Texas, beautiful. Now, did you set out from day one to be the manager on that property? You know, fourplex is a little tricky with management in terms of, you know, do you want to pay the eight, 10 percent to third party and kind of eat into your cash flow? Or do you want to be the one signing leases? How did you approach that? Yeah, you got it. You got it. So I, I actually went into third party uh, management. And uh, so I, I, I was remote. So I was in California and I was remotely managing it. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't do the work myself. So I actually went through um, three property managers, third party. And I, I just, I, I know there's a lot more bad than good in this industry. So I had three bad ones and I, I was just done. I mean, there was, there were some items I was flying out and checking in the property and I was being billed, you know, 500 bucks for broken windows that weren't even repaired. So fired those guys. Yeah. Uh, next guys, you know, it was communication. Uh, I had tenants leaving due to poor communication. I said, Hey guys, it's not rocket science. I want good rates, good service and communication. So by the third one, I, I was kind of fed up and I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to start my own management company and hire somebody. And this is after I acquired a few more rentals to go ahead and manage my own personal properties. So that, that's kind of what I did getting into the, into the third party game. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, and that's got to be tricky doing it when you're that remote. Uh, you know, in Texas, sometimes we joke about California owners. I guess you were the California owner at the time, right? <laughs> you got it. You got it. We love those owners. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> out, when we're buying, out of sight, out of mind. And, uh, and when we're selling too, you know, if California owners, uh, California money will buy you a ton of real estate in Texas for sure. You got it. You got so, it. So that's, you know, obviously you still have that, that fourplex. So, I mean, it couldn't have been too bad after a while. And I mean, I'm sure you've seen some uh, really tremendous appreciation over that time, no? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And speaking of California uh, buyers, I just sold one complex and I, I rolled it in some passive deals. We could probably get into that in a bit, but I, I mean, I love them. I, I know them and I stuck with it because it was so easy and yep. the cash flow was great. Um, I had, you know, at that time, that's all I knew. So I figured instead of having a single family home, if, if one unit goes vacant, I'm still 75% occupied. Yeah. So I, I love that aspect. And then uh, just, just the, the, the amount of equity that I came into when we bought it right. And, and the cash flow was amazing around that time, you know, from 20, 30, 40% cash on cash. And, Outstanding. and I was going down the standard, you know, just Fannie Mae route. Um, you know, I got my, my 10 Fannie Mae loans, the first, you know, four, I think at that time it was 20% down, but then I got penalized once you got above four properties, they, they move it up and penalized for multifamily. So they kick up the down payment to 30% at that point. But Right. That's kind of all I knew. So I saw that first one work and then, and then kept buying after that once we got enough cash flow saved up for, from that initial one. So it was a real slow start. I mean, I think the next one I bought was two years later with yeah. that cash flow. Yeah, it definitely takes – so, you know, kudos for taking that first step because I think that's often the hardest, right, like that first deal. And it should be terrifying because, you know – if you don't have the skill set or track record, you don't want to lose your own money or especially other people's money. But getting over that hump, getting that first one done, I think it puts you, you know, I think about it like going from zero to one. There's a lot of people with zero investments in real estate that want to be a one or a two or a 10 or a hundred, but they, they just never get over that hump. So, you know, you get over that hump and then you, you know, another thing I heard is you, you rinse and repeat, you know, you're, you're not out there trying to try every strategy under the sun. You go, well, this worked. Let's do it again and reinvest profits. And there, you just can't say enough for that approach of doubling down on what works and let cash flow pile up and keep buying more of it. I and mean, that's how, that's how these uh, empires are made. So that's awesome. How did you, um, you know, from the beginning, starting with these fourplexes, did you have a big goal that you, you know, you wanted to get into larger multifamily someday, or did this kind of unfold naturally as you, you went through the, the process? Yeah, it was a, it was a natural progression. Uh, I, I kind of learned, I mean, through podcasts and reading. So uh, I didn't have any formal training. I, I just knew what I didn't want, which was corporate America and then the golden handcuffs. 
Yep. And after that first one, I kind of saw, hey, m- maybe this is a way out. I, I never thought it would actually happen. It was right. just nice to get a little bit of passive income to help pay some bills. And um, after that first one worked, you know, the next net logical progression is to buy another one. So I, I did that. And then, you know, by that time, every year I would have enough cash flow to buy another property. So yep. next three years, I bought a few more duplexes. And then after that, about every six months, I would have enough cash flow to buy another property. So it was like a big snowball. It started off really slow. And then uh, once I got to an inflection point, it was kind of like an exponential growth at that point. And then I, I you know, had like something like 13 fourplexes, a bunch of duplexes, a few single family homes. I, I was buying everything that I could at that time in, in Austin. And then um, along the way, I knew the, the, the pain point in property management. And I had people reaching out to me just because of my network and, and the contacts I made saying, hey, Jason, you know, sounds like you know what you're doing. Can you manage our property? So I kind of just, uh, you know, got pulled into third party management as well for, for other individuals. And it's, it's not, it's not a lot of money in that business. It was kind of just, you know, something we do on the side, but uh, we had the infrastructure and process in place, at least for the small stuff, the, the, the one to four units. Sure. It just, just grew from there. So it was definitely not planned at all. Just kind of a natural progression. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you guys still do any third party management for other, for other owners? Yeah, we, we do. We do. I'm not, I'm not really pushing that side of the business to bring right. on clients. Uh, we know uh, where the wealth is built is kind of what we're doing, you know, and growing the, the personal properties that we own and, and syndication side. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I love the snowball aspect of it. You know, my story is kind of the same of starting with starting at zero and, and you just let cash flow pile up and, and boy, you get a handful of properties cash flowing and you're right. You see kind of this exponential, um, amount of money coming in, you just keep reinvesting it, you know? So that's fantastic. What got you into, uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about kind of your transition to some of the larger multifamily stuff. Let me ask real quick, what's, what's your portfolio look like today on kind of the larger multifamily side? Uh, I am lead in two smaller properties. So my largest, uh, sponsored property is a 77 unit in San Antonio. And uh, I am looking for my next deal. Um, In that time, I've also wanted to learn the business before I got in, um, before I did sponsorship. So I kind of had my own small apartments, uh, you know, little stuff, six, eight, 16 unit to learn with my own money. And then, um, so I got my hundred IRO doors. I have my my small, you know, 77 units sponsored. And then I'm I'm partnered in about 1600 units uh, passively with other friends and, and sponsors. Outstanding. So what do, you, what do you mean by IRO? Maybe you can define that for folks. Sure, sure. So that, that's independent rental owner, I believe is what it stands for. So those are properties that I own and operate with, with no partners and I don't syndicate or, or pay out to any other partners. Gotcha. Just you and the bank, right? You got it. You got it. My biggest partner, yeah. the bank. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. That's, that's the way to be. I mean, if you can, if you can own deals without partners, pretty cool. But as you scale up and grow and, you know, sometimes it makes sense to bring on other equity partners, um, are you on the larger multifamily stuff? Are you also the management company or you're using third party on some of that? Yeah, we're, we're the management company. So we, we definitely self-manage. Um, I'm a, I'm a control freak Devin. So I, I like have to go through those, those first three as like, nah, you know, I can do it better than anybody. And, and right. that's a slip and slope, you know, so it's definitely stunting my growth because I want to make sure that we do it right. But I have the control over the asset and there's, I don't think there's any one, right way to do it. I mean, everybody makes money, you know, not everybody, but I mean, there's multiple different ways to do it, but it's definitely slowed my growth rather than going third party on the, on the big stuff. But I've learned a lot along the way. So it's, it's definitely, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I love doing it. You know, you, you deal with the management problems, the employee problems. It's basically everything comes to you. But um, go the next one, I mean, i I actually had an offer in on a, uh, we actually had it under contract. We had to bow out of a 200 plus unit. Yeah. But if I go that big, I, I may consider uh, the third party model. I'm still toying with that, whether I want to keep going this route, whether I want to go completely passive or still do all three. I mean, I love the passive side. You, you don't sure. do much in checks, but I, I mean, you, you get bored after a while, right? So I, I don't like sitting around doing nothing. So you talk about first world world problems, you know, retired and bored. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, yeah. Problem. Yeah. yeah, you got to figure out the, the solution to being retired and bored, but definitely a good problem to have. Yes, um, sir. Yeah, that, you know, you've got flexibility to, to do so many different things. And, and uh, those passive investments, you know, I've passive investments too. And it, it, this, on a multifamily syndication, it is passive. I mean, you get quarterly checks, whatever it is, maybe some updates from the sponsor, but I mean, you, you can do whatever you want if you want to go drive the property or whatever, but you're required to do really zero outside of, you know, vetting the sponsor, vetting the deal and sending in the wire. And then you're kind of just done. And that's such a scalable, assuming you've got some capital to deploy, that's such a scalable uh, model. And then you can go and do your own deals too. And so, I mean, it's such a, that's such a great way to diversify into different deals. And are, is all your stuff in Texas, all, all your passive investments? Yeah, I sold my last property in, in California. It's like the first property I ever owned, a little condo. And, and I've actually 1031 that silly little condo into 30 units in Austin and San Antonio. Right. So I, what was, uh, you mind me asking what your California property sold for? Oh, what was it? Uh, I think it was, I bought it for 224, I believe. And it sold for 530, I believe. Yeah. There you go. So I had it for about 15 years and, and got the heck out of there quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And put it in a bunch more units in Texas. Love it, man. Love yeah. It. Yeah. And deferred all the, you know, the, the, the gains on it. So, you know, defer, 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 and then, and then die and, you know, hopefully pass it down to the kids at that stepped up basis, which makes real estate so great. I mean, all the taxes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. You know, that's, um, it's good to hear a success story on a 1031 because it, we, you know, we know a 1031 exchange um, is, a, is a tool that we have to defer taxes and roll it. Sometimes with these syndications, it gets a little tricky and it's easier to just say, hey, just pay the piper as you go. But, you know, for deals that you control like that, and you're able to roll it into bigger properties. I mean, that's what it was, that's what it was made to do. So it's awesome to hear a success story on being able to defer the taxes like that. Yeah, it wasn't easy. It was actually, yeah. I had uh, one property and usually it's the other way around, but I 1031 into three separate properties to get that, that 30 units. So there, there's a lot that had to, had to line up, but made it happen. Yeah, that's, that's great. And those three properties were all yours, not, uh, not syndicated. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes it easier when you're not having a, to split that up, but yeah, congratulations. That's great. And paying, uh, paying zero taxes on that on that turn of the wheel. Love it. So you're, you've got the, the management company, you've got uh, a lot of passive investments, you know, current investments uh, on the larger multifamily side. Um, what's your hold strategy on, on the properties that you're the, that you're a sponsor or an independent rental owner on, on like the 77 unit and the other ones, is that stuff where you're going to go in and make some improvements and, and hold it for a while? Or are you trying to flip these or what's your approach on that? Yeah, yeah. So, so we went into this. Our, our business plan was a three to five year plan. So the specifically on the 77 unit, we found some operational issues and some rents that were below market in, in that sub market. So we, we knew the area a bit and we knew we can come in, do some minor changes. Uh, I considered that a hybrid play. So it wasn't extreme value and it wasn't just a pure yield play. So right. I said, hey, we can come in, you know, we can fix up some units. Uh, we can improve the operations. Um, you know, improve the occupancy and reduce expenses a bit. And next thing you know, with, you know, whatever cap rate is out there, the projection was hopefully, you know, a hundred percent return, total return in three to five years. So kind of just went in with that model of, you know, getting in and out within three to five years and, and giving all the equity back to the, to the investors to basically keep doing it and, and, you know, make roll into the next property. But it, it was, wasn't a huge deal. It was just a, you know, kind of operational play and, and, a, and a hybrid. That's great. Did you guys end up doing a rebrand on that property? Or was it, was it kind of sufficient as it, as, as it, as it stood? Yeah, it, it wasn't. Um, the, I know you have a lot of experience in rehab, but I, I, I don't. So I chose this property because a lot of the units have already been fully rehabbed. And they did a lot of the nice. heavy lifting on the exterior, uh, new roofs, all new siding out front. Uh, I think there's about 15 units that were original uh, units and, right. and those were actually Saha units. And this is a, oh, wow. uh, at San Antonio housing authority for, for those that don't know. And it's like stepping back in time going in those things. It was uh, built in 1972 and yeah. everything original in those things. It no kidding. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I see, I see a lot of old 
beat up units that need to be renovated, but rarely do I see 70s vintage property untouched. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. I think except for the, uh, I think the, the dishwasher and the refrigerator, everything else was huh, straight out of the 70s. Yeah. Do you have any shag carpet in there? I mean, no uh, shag carpet, luckily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tile tile yeah. floors. <laughs> we don't like carpet, man. Tile floors all day long. Love it. Yeah. That's great. So, and that's a, that's a great projection to have, you know, ret returning equity, basically, you know, a two X equity multiple in three, four, five years. That's a great return for everybody. If you're, can you go into detail on how much equity you raise, how many investors you have on that project? Yeah, sure. So we, we did a 1.4 million equity raise on that. Uh, we have 15 investors in, including myself. So not, not a lot, but, um, you know, one of my first syndications, I think that's a good step rather than going, you know, 100, 200 units. I wanted to start off slow uh, with my own personal stuff, kind of learn the business because I, I take this very serious. I mean, I, I deal with all my own, you know, investments, but once I got to the point where I'm accepting other people's capital, I, I take it way more serious in my stuff. So I definitely wanted to know, make sure I knew what I was doing. And then uh, once once we did that, yeah, we there was no real issues closing the deal. I mean, um, it was nice. all relationships. It was it was listed on the market. Um, got a got a blast from the broker with the OM, and my broker actually had a relationship with with their listing agent. And yep. it, it turned out I, I go to the gym and, and work out with um, uh, the the guy that, that is the director of the brokerage. So I had a I had a good contact there. Excellent. So kind of fell in place. No, no, no real issues. It worked out pretty nice on the, on the acquisition. Yeah, that's great. When, uh, you know, when these things, you know, we do a lot of single family stuff where we're really wrangling deals from owners and it's, they're all a mess, but sometimes on the multifamily side, um, it can be clean. You've got a broker and you've got, you know, maybe a loan broker or a lender that you're teeing up and you're putting the team in place to, to execute it. Were you able, was it a stabilized deal? You're able to put some non-recourse debt on or what kind of a loan product did you guys go with? Yeah, well, it was stabilized. So 90% for, for 90 days. And I, I went down the, the Freddie, uh, Freddie Mac route on this one. Beautiful product. Yeah. I love love that loan product. Uh, the one negative is 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 there's no uh, supplemental with that product. Great, Great point. Uh, once yeah. we get to the term of my business plan, uh, I, I I don't know if I should have went the Fannie route, but if we do need to take that equity out, it's going to have to be a, a sell or refinance because we don't have that supplemental. Sure, sure. And or you could just end up cash flowing it. You know, I mean, we've got a deal that's similar. It's like, hey, it's assumable, but we made. A lot of improvements. I don't know that anybody's going to want to assume the loan at the, the basis, you know, that it need to be at. But um, just kind of a note on those on that Freddie Max is a small balance loan. SBL. Yep. Yeah, that SBL. I mean, the, the application process is just kind of like a cakewalk compared to some of these other, uh, you know, bridge loans or fanny loans. And so that if you got a deal like that, that's stabilized, you, you don't have this huge CapEx component. You just want to hang on to it for a few years you can really get into one of those loans for relatively easily, relatively low fees. And uh, it's just a good product for the right, you know, for the right deal. Absolutely. Yep. Can't, can't so, these interest rates. I know everybody's complaining about interest rates going up. They stabilized right. a bit, but I mean, I, I'm, you know, 40, 41 and uh, you know, I wasn't investing in the eighties, but it's all relative, you know, compared to what, I mean, this is still, you know, absolutely amazing. So, we can lock in that long, long term debt. I'm just loading up as much as I can at this point. And long term's the key. Yeah, that's right. Be able to ride out a cycle if you've got a 10 or 12 year maturity on that debt, you know, and we're, we're long in the cycle. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But if you're locking in a rate, you know, five or five and change for 10, 12 years, um, that is great spot to be in. You hear some of the, uh, some of the guys that have been in the business a little longer say that, you know, an interest rate with a single digit is good. You know, <laughs> we're over here pulling our hair out over seeing rates over 5%, but they're not 15%. So yeah, that's right, man. We got a lot to be thankful for. Um, so you've, you, you know, you built this up very, I love the, I love that your story is kind of this organic growth. It wasn't, um, you know, if we all walked into this thing with millions of dollars and, and, and uh, you know, a family that, that grew up with it or whatever, that's one thing. But kind of creating it from scratch is a really inspiring story and snowballing it and building to, to where you're at now. 
So you've, you tested it out with your own money, built up your skill set, your confidence. Now you're taking other people's money for syndications. What, what do you feel like is the next step kind of, you know, from this point moving forward? Yeah, the, the next step. So once I got to a hundred IRO doors, you know, I had, shoot, I had 20, you know, loan loans coming in. I had, I don't know how many utility bills, uh, you know, when tenants would vacate, you, you'd have all the utility bills, the electric, all the water at turnovers, all the different insurance policies. So I, I, I know people say you'll get to a, a point where you want to have more under one roof. And I finally got to that. It was about a hundred units. I just had wow. way too much admin stuff to deal with. Sure. So I said, I, I can't keep growing this way. You know, I, I, I have to look at it bigger. And that's, that's the only way to really grow. So that's when I started getting into the smaller apartment, seeing how that worked a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, 77 unit. And right now, I don't know, to, to answer your question, I, I mean, I like the passive side. But I, I think I am looking for, I think I want to do at least one more deal, 200 plus units and, and, and keep growing and, and sponsor another deal. Uh, it, it's fun. I mean, it, it's not all fun and roses. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, I learned, learn, you know, there's issues you have to work through. But I, I love the business. I mean, compared to where I came from in corporate America, I know I never want to go back there. So I'll do whatever it takes to make this real estate thing work. <laughs> <laughs> once you get a taste, of, yeah, once you cross over, it's, it's like you're, uh, uh, it's a completely different world. I agree. There's stresses associated with it and so forth. But yeah, yeah I would never go back. Yeah, I totally agree. So yeah. And I, I um, think uh, – Drawing, I mean, guys like you inspire me. So I see where you started from and how far you came now. I mean, I remember you helped me out, uh, full disclosure, on some due diligence on one of my small properties. You know, that's, that's right. kind of where we, where we met. We've known each other for quite a few years. And I mean, seeing you grow and definitely grow into the bigger stuff. I mean, I, I think that's just the next logical progression. And it's, it's awesome to have so many friends in the industry because you got friends that push you, you know, inspire you and you see what other people can do. And you know, if, if these guys can do it, you know, I, I can do it. Anybody can do it, really. So I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, I've got so many people that I feel the same, same about. Like, man, just people that have maybe a little further down the road than me that have been so inspiring and just frankly so helpful, too, you know, yeah. kind, of, kind of help each other along. And it gets, it gets to be a small world kind of in the bigger multifamily space. It's funny. There's kind of a handful of brokers, a handful of owners. Everybody kind of knows each other. Um, so what um, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of ask, because you hear a lot of podcasts and everything about it, all the great things about real estate, depreciation and cash flow. You know, we're buying B and C properties, which, you know, typically means 70s, 80s construction. It might mean, uh, you know, kind of workforce housing. Sometimes you got some, uh, some interesting characters that you get to interact with. Do you have any like C-class stories over the years that, you know, that kind of stuck out that, uh, that you don't mind sharing? I mean, any kind of craziness that's happened on, on one of your projects? And if, if not, that's fine. I get it. But we, I've certainly have had a few interesting stories over the years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this has ha happened to quite a few people, but you know, as I was going in and, and touring properties, I, I actually did go into one unit and I don't know if the manager didn't give notice to, to all the tenants that they were going to do a tour. And we came into this unit. And as soon as you open the door, you know, there's these guys in there, just weed smoke hit us right in the face. I think I got high when I opened the door. <laughs> and, uh, we kind of just popped our head in there and looked around. And there's these two guys. I mean, they were, they were high as a kite. They're yeah. just sitting on the, on the couch with the bong on the table. And they kind of, I mean, they didn't even look scared or, or surprised. They kind of just looked at us. And was like, oh, sorry to, to bug you. We closed the door. It's like, okay. <laughs> I'm that's sure that hilarious. happens to a lot of people. That's, yeah. that's a cool one to run into. <laughs> no doubt. You know, if somebody's listening to this podcast in 2022 or whatever, they, they're going to go, so what? Uh, pot's legal everywhere. What does it matter? Right. But, you know, at the time, and at this time, at least in Texas, you know, still, uh, still not legal. We'll see what the future holds. But, yes, yeah, yes. so you know, there's definitely some, some characters sometimes on, uh, on some of these properties and that's just kind of part of the, uh, part of the business. Um, any, uh, any advice you would impart to anybody that's, that's looking at kind of self-managing on, on the multifamily stuff? Is there anything, you know, you've learned so much over the years actually doing these, these things and having hands on these properties, any kind of recurring themes or things that have helped you that, that you might pass along to somebody that's going to self-manage? 
Yeah, I kind of learned organically and, and slow. So I was a guy out there swinging the hammer. I, I basically did everything. I mean, I, I, would, I was the manager. Uh, I came out for the 2 a.m., you know, toilet overflowing calls. And this is on the small stuff. Um, so I kind of learned the ground up. So I, I knew when I needed to contract out stuff, whether or not I was getting a good price or being taken advantage and knowing what the cost should be on certain things. So, uh, for, for me, I kind of just learned that way. And then, um, I mean, really it's, it's, I, I don't know. I, I know you had the philosophy where you're, you're a third party guy and that's helped you really grow. Um, Self-management on the, the, the smaller stuff, it, it was a lot. Once, once I documented, because initially when we first started off, it was just, you know, kind of here's how you do it. We talk through it. We run into a problem. We say, hey, we, we lesson learned. You don't do it that way. Sure. But once I got my operations manual put together with specific steps and all the process and procedures clearly documented, that, that's what really, I think, took us to the next level of being more of a professional third-party manager. So right. we, we learned the hard way on my, all my personal stuff, but on the, on the bigger stuff, that's a whole different ball game on that, on that side of the management fence. Um, so I kind of just talked to a lot of other self self management guys that own and operate their own property and got a lot of good feedback from them. And the same thing, I had to put together a whole separate operations manual just for the, to the five unit and above properties. Cause it's a whole different beast. So I think the key for me was clearly identifying processes and procedures sure. to grow the property and every possible problem or issue can, you can encounter, hey, here's how you handle it. You know, go to the operations manual. Here's what you do. And that way, once we get another property, it's going to be uniform against, you know, across the whole portfolio. Yeah, that's such a great point. Building out the, the operations manual to a very minute detail. And then you build, you grow it over time. Um, you, you have to do it. I mean, somebody's got to have the expertise on the property, you know, and it, it might be third party. If somebody's got 20 years experience, it might be you that's built your own experience up, but somebody's got to have, you know, the experience and, and to know how to handle a lot of these things because, you know, you put a hundred, 200 people together on a couple of acres living together. Life's going to happen, right? I mean, that's just the, that's just the way it goes. Um, one more question I want to ask kind of along that route, you know, people are just the key to any business, right? I mean, bottom line, you got to have processes and procedures and so forth, but the people that you end up hiring are really going to make or break uh, any business that you're in. Any hiring tips that, that you found to be helpful over the years, having done a lot of that yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, I started off, I, I, you know, I'm still working on hiring to be honest. So I, I every day I learn and I, I grow. So, I mean, there, there's people that slip through the cracks. They, you know, we think they're, they're great up front, but a few months down the road, they turn south or they, they get an injury. Um, I, I honestly don't know the, the answer to that. Um, you know, yeah. we have, we basically have a checklist and we have a, a test, whether it's a manager or a maintenance guy to, to actually, you know, know, or hopefully they know what they're talking about. If they answer these questions, you know, HVAC related questions correctly or on the management side, how to handle stuff. And then what we recently started doing is some working interviews. So we'll get them in and we'll, we'll actually have them, you know, they'll sound great on paper. The resume is good. They passed the test. Now we'll put them to work and actually see how quickly they work. Cause I right. had a few that kind of slipped through the cracks and, you know, once we got them on site or part of the team, they, they weren't working as fast as, as they should be. So, the working interviews, hope, hopefully that'll help out a bit to, to weed through a lot of the, the guys that kind of slip through the skirting process, the in-person and the, and the testing process. But I'm still growing there and working on that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's constantly evolving. What, what tests are you using to send your, your guys through kind of during that employment process? Well, it's, it's, a, it's one that we kind of found online and then changed it to, to fit our needs. So basically different types of Freon, you know, for like the maintenance guys, you know. The, the pressures that systems need to be charged to, uh, if you can mix certain refrigerants together, just some basic stuff. You know, we know if they get it wrong, they clearly don't know what they're doing with HVAC. Absolutely. HVAC. You know if they have their EPA uh, universal certs. Yeah, yeah, and that's got to save everybody a huge amount of heartache up front. That's, uh, yeah. that's a tremendous investment up front. 
Well, right. Jason, this is, this is fantastic. I, I love learning more about your story and, and hopefully it's been inspiring to some people that can hear this. Um, if somebody wants to reach out to you and get to know you a little bit better, learn a little bit more about your business, what's the best way for people to do that? Uh, they can reach out through my website. It's uh, jmbgrouppm.com. That's Juliet Mike Bravo. And feel free to shoot us an email there if they have any questions. I'd uh, love to help anyone out. Awesome. Jason, thanks so much for sharing your story and your, your wisdom with us. We'll put the website in the show notes for the episode. And um, best of luck on the next acquisition, man. I'm, I'm sure you'll get it here before too long. Awesome, brother. Talk to you soon. Thanks, All right. Bud. Take care. Thank you for listening to the DJE Podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.